So thank you to the organizers. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with such great company celebrating a great mathematician. Hope I can uh, get some good feedback on this work. And this work, there's a sort of uh, context to it. At KU Leuven, there's a, there's a group of us all working on redundant approximation type problems. There's Don Herbrix, the professor, it's myself. Uh, there's Vincent Coppe, Roma Tyson, and Andrew Gibbs. And I'll reference these people where appropriate during the talk. OK, so what is the motivation for this work? Uh, essentially, in two words, it's corner singularities. So if you're solving a differential equation on a domain uh, with, uh, with corners, it's, it's typical that you're going to get singularities in those corners. So f for example, this middle figure here is, uh, is a simple constant coefficient problem with zero derivative boundary conditions. You get weak logarithmic singularities in each of the corners. And it really, really hurts uh, trying to solve these problems. Uh, but these, these, these are not so bad. What, I, what is quite bad is for the, uh, the MATLAB logo, which I have rotated uh, sneakily to look around the back of. Uh, <laughs> and right around the back, which usually is hidden from view, there's, a, there's an algebraic singularity here. There's an infinite derivative. And that really means that you have to use some specialist methods to, to solve that differential equation. Usually, the location and the nature of these singularities is known uh, by some asymptotics. Um, and there are a number of methodologies for dealing with these sets of problems. So mesh refinement in, in uh, finite element <coughs> methods. So a recent paper of Gopal and Trefethin on using rational functions uh, with the poles <coughs> clustering near to the, the singularities uh, and all sorts of other methods. Uh, but this is the motivation. This isn't what I'm going to talk about. I want to focus on numerical linear algebra. That's what we're all here for. Uh, so I'm going to keep the, a model problem very simple. So consider a function of this form uh, on the interval minus 1, 1. It's a smooth function, g plus square root 1 minus x squared times by another smooth function. And more generally, you can think of just some linear combination of, of singular functions weighting smooth functions. So g and h are unknown, but we can sample f. If we knew g and h, we could just use you know, Chebfun or something to approximate g and h. They're, they're smooth functions, we would do a very good job. But if you can only sample f, that's not going to work. So what I'm suggesting here is to use linear combinations of Chebyshev polynomials and weighted Chebyshev polynomials in equal numbers. So there'd be n, my n Chebyshev polynomials and n weighted Chebyshev polynomials. So that's these guys and these guys. Uh, if you Your get bigger than one. Yes, so I've, I've, I've uh, normalized <laughs> them. So the first one is also smaller than the other ones. So they're not the, uh, the standard Chebyshev polynomials. So maybe I should have put a tilde over the T. Um, OK, well, the first thing you might try to do is, is to do a collocation for, these, uh, for this problem at Chebyshev points. That's going to give you a, a, a linear system. Uh, which we can solve in a least squares sense if we take more samples than, uh, than coefficients. So we have a right-hand side, which is a, a normalized evaluation of the function at Chebyshev points. And then we have a matrix. The first n columns are just the, uh, the Chebyshev polynomials evaluated at Chebyshev points. The last n columns are the weighted Chebyshev polynomials. And well, what happens if you just look at that system? Well, you find it's extremely ill-conditioned. Scarily or conditioned. Condition numbers greater than 4 to the n. So take n equal to 30 and you, you basically, you, what are you going to do? Uh, you're not going to find the, co the coefficients. However, if you use an SVD or a pivoted QR least square solver, just the LA pack type things, uh, they work like a charm. So they, this is the, uh, the SVD of such a matrix. Uh, there's a lot of moderately sized singular values, and they quickly plunge down. And this is just machine error. But they, they, they go right down. So this is 10 to the minus 15. And so the first one, is it really constant, or are they slightly decaying? They're slight, there's, a, there's a shape to them. Yeah. There's a shape to them based on the image of, uh, of square root 1 minus x squared. And, and this is the kind of convergence you're going to get in terms of the errors as, as n increases. 
If you took just polynomials, you get very poor convergence. If you took weighted polynomials, still quite poor. The purple line is if you, if you knew the, the G and the H, and you just used Chebfun, that would get exponential convergence if G and H were smooth. But this green line is using pivot to QR on this extremely ill-conditioned linear system, which even when N is larger than a sort of convergence point, it, the error still remains quite small. You don't get a blow-up of error, which is surprising. So what's going on? Well, let's look at the epsilon truncated SVD. So you just take the, the SVD of, of A, kill all the singular values less than epsilon, where epsilon is some uh, modest multiple of machine precision, as Wilkinson would say. Uh, that solution satisfies this inequality. It only takes a few lines to prove. I'm told that it's common knowledge, but I've never seen it in the literature. So if someone can give me a reference to something like this, that would be nice for, for writing it into paper. Uh, it sort of says that, well, if you can find a solution to this system, which is a small residual and a modest norm of coefficients, then this epsilon truncated SVD solution will do, do well. Although there's nothing to suggest that you'll be able to find a small norm, a moder modest norm coefficient solution. Excuse me, what's your criterion for doing well? Making the residual small? Making the residual small. But so it's, you're not interested in the accuracy of the solution? Well, you're not interested in the coefficients. The coefficients don't matter. You're interested in, in, the, in the error in the approximation. But actually, this, the next bit will, will explain a bit more. You're actually interested in, in a continuous norm error of the function. The coefficients don't matter. They're, you know, it's, it's not the desired quantity, the coefficients. It's actually what the coefficients produce, which is a function. Um, okay, so if, if, if we go a bit further and look at least squares collocation systems for a dictionary of functions with certain sampling collocation matrices, then there is this very complicated result, which essentially says that there is, some, there is a constant here which we would like to be small, and that we want the, the norm of the coefficients to be small. And there's some, there's some theoretical justification to suggest that as long as this dictionary is what's called a frame, which I'm not going to explain, then and you oversample sufficiently much, so m is sufficiently large relative to n, then this will remain bounded as n gets large, and also for sufficiently large n, these coefficients will be small. But I don't want to dwell on this. This is just the, the approximation theory justification that th this, this error can be made small. But the message so far is that using, ex using uh, oversample collocation with a truncated SVD or a pivoted QR uh, is effective for some extremely ill-conditioned problems. But I want to work out if there's any fast solvers for certain problems. So I'll introduce an algorithm. In our group, we've been calling it the AZ algorithm. Americans might have trouble with that. <laughs> Call it the AZ algorithm. Um, but it's essentially, it's an algorithm for solving AX equals B, but there's some auxiliary matrix Z. And it's, it's, there's three steps to it. So instead of solving AX equals B, we multiply by I minus AZ star on both sides and solve that system. Bear with me. And the next system does this correction step only involving matrix multiplication, and then you add the two results together. It seems a bit strange, but this might enlighten you a bit. So what is the residual if I, if I was to do these three steps? Well, if I just look at what x is, I, I get to this, this step. If I expand out what x2 is, I get to the next step. And I group terms, I see that the final residual is just the same as the residual of step one. So this, this step two essentially passes the book onto step one. But it also passes the book in terms of the computational cost. Because step two is just matrix multiplication, and step three is just addition. So it sort of shifts, shifts the problem. And the idea is that we can find a Z such that this matrix is low rank, or well, numerically low rank. And this is, the, this is a, 
This is our fast algorithm for certain problems. And I'll show that for this model problem, it is can be made fast, quasi-linear. Okay, just an aside, solving a low rank system fast. If you have an extremely skinny matrix and you want to do a, a least squares solver, you can do that in order m r squared operations. But we don't have a skinny matrix, we have, we have an m by n matrix. But suppose it is, is low rank, or numerically low rank. What can we do then? Well, you could take a random matrix with an extra 20 columns and solve A times by that random matrix, which is, a, which is a skinny matrix, and then just multiply the end result by W. Uh, and there's a very a highly cited paper by Halko Martinson and Tropp, Finding Structure with Randomness, which I hope almost everyone in this audience is aware of. Uh, it's got over 2,000 citations. Using techniques from that paper, you can show that if you, d if you do this sort of randomized least squares solver, then the residual will be less than, than this, this formula here. So there's a kappa here, and then there's the remaining singular values that are greater than R. But what does the probability depend? They say with extremely high probability, what does it depend? It depends on this, or this, this extra columns. So the, you, have extra, you, have, you have explicit formulas, but they're very messy and pessimistic, but they give the right. It's, it's, it's concentration inequality is similar I to what Nick was talking about. What yeah, so they depend on, on yeah. They, this essentially only depends on, on R and P. And it's, it's, order, it's, it's expectation is something, that, something on the order of uh, square root R. But the probability gets better and better as you take this. I've set this to be 20. P equals 20. Okay, so we want to choose a Z matrix to make that first step low rank so we could use that randomized low rank solver. So that first step was this modification of the system. So if I expand that out, it's A minus A Z star A. We want that to be low rank. It's essentially saying Z star is a pseudo inverse up to a low rank error. Uh, and so I have a theorem which says that if its matrix A comes from an oversample co-location matrix for BV, bounded variation weighted sum of copies of a 1D trig basis. Uh, so BV, you're allowed jumps, you're, you're allowed integrable derivatives, uh, such as these algebraic singularities and, and so on. If, if you take Z to be the dual, what's called the dual frame, which I'll explain in a second, then the, the, the rank of this matrix is log N. And that will lead to an order n log n squared algorithm for this, this AZ algorithm. So you go from an n cubed pivot to QR to an n log n squared <coughs> algorithm. So I'll just demonstrate these matrices, show you <coughs> beyond doubt that uh, they're very simple. So this, I'll build a matrix here. This is a, a D, DCT matrix, and then I I make some, some weights of 1 and square it 1 minus x squared and then I weight I weight them appropriately to make the co-location matrix for these, this, uh, this dictionary. If I put the singular values, they look like this. So as you asked before, the singular values do have some sort of structure, but it's an extremely ill-conditioned matrix. Now, what I mean by this dual frame is I just do the same sort of co-location matrix, but I divide the weights by the sums of the squares of the weights. If I use that matrix and call that Z, this guy has a similar decomposition. But if I look at this I minus A, Z star A, it's actually a numerically low rank matrix. And it's rank is order log N. And so this has all been implemented in a package called FrameFun. And what I'm about to show you very quickly is, is what I'm calling FrameFun Lite, which is about 150 lines of code, which codes everything up in this quasi-linear time. And yeah, you can approximate whatever function you want. This is 1 plus sine x plus x x times by the singularity. And it adaptively makes the length right. And you're getting extremely good residuals point-wise. 
Ah, you can make them relative. It's yes, then they would be larger, though. But the, the, the function as, as norm 1, because I'm scaling the samples, remember. I scaled them all by 1 over square root m to make them have L2 norm. So I've got my last slide here. Uh, there's nothing new on it. Uh, it's just a summary. The main thing is that this AZ algorithm essentially trans transforms x equals b into this system where you can choose z to your advantage. Uh, thank you for listening. Idea. I'm just wondering, does that include some other like, well-known algorithms as a special case, like other choices of Z than, than the one you're taking? Yes, so one of the examples we're looking at in the paper we're writing up is uh, if, you're if you're trying to make a Fourier series for a, for example, a sound, a sound file, and you know there's going to be a jump, you can actually put a weighting to ignore the jump so that you can get you can avoid the Gibbs phenomenon. And you can still do this in, in, in a quasi linear time. So there are some other problems, but actually this 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 there's a <laughs> very good observation that this is a an algorithm waiting for more applications. <laughs> You look worried. Uh, well, it's fascinating, <laughs> uh, but I wasn't quick enough to catch something. So are, for this to be efficient, is it important that the rank be much less than the number of columns? Is that the mode you're in? Because the mode we're in, the rank might yes. be half the number of it columns. But it it's only helpful if it's little over n. I see. OK. And, is and in actual applications, are, are you going to be in that mode? We're not. Um, no, not necessarily. So well, well, well OK. So if, you, if you're looking at the in uh, multidimensional problems, where we have these Fourier extensions where you, the weight is essentially a characteristic function of some domain. In those situations, you're getting order square root n plunger ranks. So, <coughs> doesn't, d but it, you're still beating the order n cubed algorithm. Yeah. You're just getting little lower n cubed <laughs> in general. <laughs>